Okay, so uh, if you take a seat, we can start the last lecture by Mukund. Okay, so just uh, quickly remind you where we were and uh, then get on with uh, today's uh, discussion. So in the last three lectures, I started out by motivating a very general set of questions uh, in quantum field theory and gave you a gen picture of what kind of path integral contours we would consider to answer those questions and argued for you that those contours, while interesting, also come with an inbuilt set of redundancies that we try to encapsulate in a useful manner in terms of a sequence of topological symmetries. And I ended the last lecture by sort of talking about this algebra, which is a combination of the schwinger keldish and uh, BRST symmetries and the KMS condition that's inherent in thermal field theories. Okay, so my next task is to try to take all this discussion that was present in any quantum field theory whose microscopic degrees of freedom you know, and try to use them to motivate and construct low energy theories. Okay. So as, uh, as you were hearing in, in Nati's talk yesterday in afternoon, if you're interested in the dynamics of, as you put it, the, the water in the sea, you don't care about the individual atoms. We, we tend to use statistical mechanics to sort of coarse grain the system and talk about some macroscopic variables, primarily thermodynamic. And that's precisely the system I'm going to talk about because it exemplifies this formalism in a very nice way. So my aim is to basically give you a very broad brush overview of hydrodynamics as an effective field theory. I'm assuming that most of you are not familiar with thinking about hydrodynamics in that context, and then tell you how this formalism has been applied. I have only an hour, so I might not do full justice to tell you what the, I'll tell you the answer, but I won't go through the derivation of how we got to the answer. Okay. I'll point you to the literature of how the answer was arrived at. So our detour is to basically understand hydrodynamics, and there's a very simple one, one sentence summary, sum, summary of what hydrodynamics is. It's really the dynamics of, it's a non-equilibrium dynamics of quantum systems. In near equilibrium situations, where you're interested in long wavelength you can say this uh, long wavelength physics so these are frequencies and momenta which are much smaller than um, the thermal scale set by the system so in this regime, you can sort of take your quantum system and you can focus not on the microscopic details, but on a few macroscopic variables. Basically, roughly speaking, in thermal equilibrium, you tend to monitor simple quantities like macroscopic variables like energy densities and charge densities and so on. In, in this hydrodynamic regime, these guys are local functions and they vary from place to place, but the, and the dynamics of how they vary from place to place is a theory of hydrodynamics. Okay. So there are a few macroscopic variables. So the dynamical data of, this, of, this, of our system, which we keep track of in this limit, is simply the conserved currents let's say the energy momentum tensor as a function of space and time, or if you have charges, 
charge currents as a function of space and time. And the reason these are the only things you keep track of is you have a system, it's almost in equilibrium, it's not quite, the deviations away from equilibrium are on macroscopic scales. But what's happening is that all the disturbances that have driven the system away from equilibrium have, have mostly died out and the things that survive to long distances and late times are things that are constrained by conservation to, to decay back slowly. So you could imagine that you take a, you know, an equilibrated system, it could be a air in this room or, 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 or a glass of water which, which has been sitting there for a while and you come and hit it, there'll be a lot of transient effects initially where lots of things will be, will be happening. But if you wait long enough, the only sort of modes in the system that will survive are the modes that sort of talk about the conserved quantities, the local energy densities, the local charge densities, the local stresses and strains, et cetera, buried in this object. Okay. And so the dynamics of the system is actually very simple. If you think of these as quantum operators, then the dynamics is basically their conservation. If you have gauge charges, then if you have charge currents and you have background gauge fields for these charge currents, then this ch you have a covariant conservation of these charges. But you see, a lot of the details of your microscopic data has disappeared by the time you've gone down to this. Because usually, these things are constraints on the system. They're not, they don't determine the dynamics. In the hydrodynamic limit, they're the only things that survive because everything else has sort of quieted down. So it's a rather special dynamical system where conservation dictates how the system evolves. And so one needs to understand how to write down these structures in terms of some basic variables. So you can think of basically what you have is you can think of there being some kind of fluid which has some flow pattern. And in local domains, You can have local, you have, you have little domains of local equilibrium. And here there's some local temperature T of X. Here there's some other lo local temperature. And, and you have exchange of con charges, energy, momentum, so on, across these domains. So usually what people tend to do is tend to sort of talk about a flow velocity. which is some flux vector. It's no, usually normalized. And um, I'm going to work in Lorentz space time, so I'm going to talk about relativistic fluids. So my normalization is that the velocity is normalized to be unit time-like. And there's a local temperature effects. And maybe you have charges, you have local chemical potentials. Etc., and these are the data of the system as, as the system evolves. Okay? And what you need to do <coughs> is to es establish what is the energy momentum tensor <coughs> as a functional of this fluid data. And for convenience, I'll also allow myself the freedom to turn on background sources, okay? So these are the dynamical variables. These are the things which will satisfy equations of motion. But in addition, I'm going to allow myself the freedom to have, I'll probe my system by putting my fluid on either curved space or as Nati was doing, turn on background electromagnetic fields to sort of make the charges move, okay? So there will be some metric data and some gauge field data, but these are, I emphasize, backgrounds. And they're classical. Okay, we already saw the matrix show up last time when we were trying to talk about equilibrium 
on arbitrary curved space with varying temperature. This is a variant of that where now I have the temperature not just varying in space, but also in time. And therefore, this velocity field is also changing in a function of space and time. So once you have this, this gives you the dynamics, the conservation equations for which constraints what these guys, what the u's and the t's and the mu's do. So, and you can convince yourself that these are the right number of equations because this guy is a conservation equation in d dimensions. So this has d equations. This is one extra equation for a scalar equation for charge conservation. In u, I have d minus 1 variables. In t, I have one variable. And mu, I have one variable. So the system is deterministic. It has exactly the right number of degrees of freedom as there are equations. Now, life would be very simple if this was all there was for hydrodynamics. And usually, what we know phenomenologically, is that you not only have this for the conserved currents, but the, theory, the dynamics is also constrained by the second law of thermodynamics. And since everything is local, everything happens locally, it's not happening globally. It's, I, I don't have a statement which is, I, I, I'll, I'll make a local version of the usual statement which says that entropy should increase by declaring that there exists some current, a local current, which you can think of as a local flow of entropy, whose divergence satisfies the second law. So the entropy is produced in, in, in this form. Now, usually what this does for you is that it constrains the terms that can show up in the energy momentum tensor. Okay? I'll write down the energy momentum tensor in a second, but that's, that's the general structure of the phenomenological theory. <clears throat> what you also tend to usually do is you tend to ask that this, this statement hold configuration by configuration. That it holds once you've solved the fluid equations, once, you've, once you have an expression for t mu nu and you've found what u mu and t are, you then ask that the entropy on that configuration be positive, have positive definite gradient. It's a bit sort of awkward to sort of have to solve this on shell because it's a constraint system. You have to solve equations and then ask what happens on top of that. So it turns out to be actually useful to give an off shell statement. And this was turned out to be quite powerful in basically giving a, a, a complete understanding of what this phenomenological theory of hydrodynamics is. So let me explain that in a slightly useful form. So a couple of years ago, inspired by various developments in the last decade, a few of us, few of us gave an official formalism for tackling phenomenological features of hydrodynamics. And for simplicity, I'll, I'll drop this chemical potential. I'll just write equations in terms of just temperature, local temperatures. We can add charges if you want. It, it won't change the discussion over much. OK, so the natural variable I'm going to pick is the unnormalized time-like vector, beta mu. It's basically the flow vector normalized by the uh, divided by the temperature. And I'll note here that this vector is a killing field we introduced last time when the system is in equilibrium. OK, this is, this is part of the reason to introduce this this way. The time lag vector field in equilibrium, the, this vector field is, the, is, uh, uh, is killing. OK, now in terms of this, this guy, I can say that the 
ऑफिशियल एंट्रोपी कंजर्व एंट्रोपी स्टेटमेंट इज बेसिकली डी म्यू जे म्यू एस प्लस that basically some kind of legend transform so this this starts to look like some kind of first law this is like ds this is 1 over t de equals something okay so this is this is required to be positive and you can actually do some some simple tricks to this let me just write out a, a, a one, one 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 more equation and then you will see why this is very useful and why this statement is very helpful so let's define let's legendre transform the entropy current into a free energy current by basically putting together pieces involving the energy momentum tensor okay. so i'm just so again this is like s the time lag component is just s and here it's basically energy density divided by temperature so just think of the time lag component because this guy is time lag so in some in some in some inertial frame this picks out t00 and this normalized by 1 over t this picks out the entropy in the in the time lag component so this is really a free energy current up to a sign how you define the free energy <coughs> this guy tends to term, turns out to satisfy a very simple equation so the analog of this once i plug in this definition is this i have sort of just just plug, plugging plugging in and rearrange this where this guy is just the lead derivative of the background matrix with respect to the field beta okay so so this is by definition for a, the the lead drag of a matrix along a vector field is basically the the symmetrized covariant derivative on the vector field uh, sorry on the on the one form uh um, so so this is very helpful because you see that this piece will vanish if beta is killing because this is really the piece this is twice the killing equation okay so you can basically start by asking questions in the following hierarchical manner you can start by saying okay let me look at equilibrium in equilibrium nothing should happen no entropy should be produced so delta must be zero so let's classify all possible free energy currents that can show up which are conserved currents okay so you sort of simplified the problem from the point of view of trying to classify energy momentum tensors which are two tensors to the point problem of classifying conserved currents and you can argue that all such conserved currents must come from a master generating function which is like a partition function okay So I'll write this as Z equilibrium or beta mu equilibrium and G mu nu. It's just some scalar function built out of these guys, and that scalar function, if you are doing usual statistical mechanics of quantum field theory on on Minkowski space, 
with, with constant temperature everywhere, homogeneous constant temperature everywhere, is a familiar partition function. I'm just allowing myself the freedom to upgrade from that picture to the configuration I was drawing last time, where my, where my thermal circle was fibered over this base manifold sigma, and, this, and, 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 the, and the vibration structure dictates what the structure of this partition function is. Okay, so we can write down expressions for this, but you can write this down as, so the Z equilibrium basically starts out its life as the homogeneous piece, which is an integral over sigma, the base manifold, spatial manifold times um, so let's call what we had yesterday gamma, the spatial metric, sorry, it's plus because this is spatial metric, and then there's a piece here which you can think of as the free energy of the function of temperature plus gradient corrections. So this is the piece you would have if temperature was uniform everywhere, but things are changing on this manifold, so I can sort of, and I'm interested only in physics in this long wavelength regime, so I'm allowing myself the freedom that momenta are small compared to temperature, so I can expand everything in terms of derivatives. So if you want, we can write, write down in the language we had last time, you would have terms like, so this is, remember our Kaluza Klein ansatz, the geometry, That's the metric, and then you can have derivatives of terms involving derivatives of sigma. Terms involving derivatives of A, and dot, dot, dot. These are all the gradient terms, and you can assemble them and study this order by order in perturbation theory, in, in this gradient perturbation theory. Very good. So indeed. So right now I'm just writing a general expansion, and uh, I would just have to figure out the coefficients by actually evaluating the partition sum for the theory, because the I mean already the free energy that cares about what the spectrum of the theory was, but whatever it is, it is some scalar function of the temperature. So um, everything I'm going to say, I'm going to be reasonably abstract. I'm not going to specify to a particular theory. Towards the end. I'll give you one example, just as an interesting statement that, that, that one, can, one, can, one, one needs to understand. But uh, in, for, the, for, the, for most of the discussion, I'm going to assume that you have a theory in mind. So it, it could be QCD, it could be some other theory. And so, so you have to do some, some level of calculation to understand what this is. But if you do it, you'll understand the coefficients. But our logic is going to be like, like you work with effective field theories. So let, so let me remind you the, the, the model I have, one second, huh? uh, 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 model I have in mind. So think of QCD, and think of chiral symmetry breaking when you have pions, as number Goldstone bosons. So of course you could start with the theory by, by writing down the theory in terms of quarks and so on, but you're not interested in physics on, on, the, on the UV scale, you're only interested in physics around the pion scale. So you have an effective theory of pions, which you can write down in terms of the pion effective action, of, right? But in the pion effective action, there are pion couplings that are undetermined. So the analog of the pion couplings are now functions of temperature. The scalar functions, because we are, we are sort of, we are not reducing this to quantum mechanics, we're reducing this to a field theory in D, in D minus one dimensions. Is that a question? So, the, you, exist, you expect the existence of a partition function in this case because nothing, there's, a, there's a sense in which there's global equilibrium. Although, you know, this circle, this time, the, cir, the, the way the circle is, 
It's fiber non-trivially over, over the base. All that it's telling you is that locally, what different observers measure temperature is just spatially varying. So, but there is no explicit time dependence. Okay? And that, that's, all I, that, that's all that determines equilibrium, absence of explicit time dependence. Okay? A better way to say it is what is the analogy I gave you last time, which is you know that you can have spatial gradients and have equilibrium by just looking at the atmosphere. The atmosphere is not uh, a system where the temperature is homogeneous all the way through. The temperature is changing, in fact, exponentially going down as a function of, this, of, of the uh, uh, altitude. And, that, and that's, that's a sort of baby version of this. We're, we're just allowing ourselves arbitrary dependence. To talk about hydrodynamics, I would have to allow myself even the curvatures to vary slowly. But in principle, you could take any curved manifold with a time like killing field and put your field theory on it and it will be in equilibrium. It will be in equilibrium with respect to the killing field. So any observer who follows orbits of the killing field, by definition, doesn't see anything. Because it, it, you know, along a killing field, nothing changes, so this person can't see anything. And that's what equilibrium intuitively means, and that, that, that's, the impression, that's the intuition we are exploiting. OK, so, so that was something that was done four or five years ago by a bunch of people from TIFR and, uh, 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 and another group in combination of Germany and uh, Vancouver. But you can ask, can you go beyond equilibrium? Can you classify everything? Can you, can you basically tell me what is the, f so I have this equation which is supposed to be valid off shell. It's supposed to be valid before imposing the equation of motion of the energy momentum tensor conservation. Can you just tell me what are all the structures that can show up in this equation? Okay. To do that, all I need to tell you is what is the set of vectors that can show up as an entropy current? What is the set of tensors that can show up as an energy momentum tensor such that this combination is positive definite. So phrased very abstractly, it's, it's simply a question of asking, I have vectors and symmetric two tensors built out of some basic objects, in this case just beta mu and some background metric. Can you just do some algebra and say what combinations are allowed for positive definiteness? It's almost the question is almost like asking, I have some quadratic form. How do I constrain coefficients so that this quadratic form is positive definite? Okay. It's just a bit more complicated because it's a question in, in tensor space, not, not in terms of scalar quantities, which is what you'd use for quadratic forms. But basically, all the intuition you have for doing quadratic forms, you can employ here if you suitably use variables. So I'll tell you the answer of this analysis. and, and, and um, <clears throat> uh, refer you to the literature because that, that, that is going to give me a benchmark for what I want next. So you sort of ask this question and then you find that allowed classes fits into eight distinct classes. Yeah. I mean, let, let me also change JMUS because it, it does determine JMUS directly. And uh, we gave them names. And I'll just tell you what the names are. And two of them I'll describe for you in some detail. The rest I'm going to skip. Okay, so this is the class that we'd all be familiar with. So this is the class of dissipative data. And let me write an energy momentum tensor that you would usually write for hydrodynamics.
So you write some energy density, you write some pressure, both of which you would get from this free energy. Energy density is just Legendre transform of the free energy. The pressure is basically the free energy itself. And then, if you go to the next order, this is the shear tensor. It's basically the symmetrized traceless derivative. of the velocity with some coefficient, which is a function of temperature, called the shear viscosity. Okay? And this guy belongs here. So the first simplest thing you do in hydrodynamics is you see that the system has friction. The friction is encoded in this viscosity. And this viscosity is in this dissipative class. This is the thing that's everybody familiar with. Conductivity, for example, if you have charge current, belongs here. But then I have this plethora of things which, by definition, are not dissipative. What do they do? So this dissipative class is a class that you get by solving this inhomogeneous equation with a non-zero delta on the right-hand side. It's the only class that contributes to delta. And the claim is, by playing around with the intuition about quadratic forms, you can assemble this dissipative stress tensor. So there's a T mu nu. If you want, you can put a D here to say that it's a part of the stress tensor that comes from dissipation. And this guy can be assembled along with J mu S dissipative into a piece that gives you a positive definite object explicitly. Okay. So I can write a formula for this. This is the easy one. And you can show that this guy has to be of the form okay. again the intuition is that this guy is some kind of basic building block uh, sorry only one of them there, because then you take this guy and put it in here, then you start seeing that it starts looking like a perfect square. Okay, because it's a perfect square in a space where you take two tensors and two tensors, which are symmetric, and then you combine them with a four tensor. And as long as this four tensor respects the symmetries, it's actually even symmetric under the exchange of mu nu and rho sigma. And is positive definite. It's a quadratic form in the space of two tensors. Then you're in business. Hmm? So, so T mu nu has, can be decomposed into eight distinct pieces. In the dissipative class, you can argue that T mu nu has to take the form of a four tensor contracted with the lead derivative of the matrix with respect to beta. This, this, this guy fits in that class. The second term fits in this class. So this guy, I claim, can be written like this. No, no. So, so, so th that was equilibrium. Sorry. This is equilibrium. This is not equilibrium because this is dissipation. And this guy belongs here. Yes. So it's some, at, at this point, as, 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 I was, as I was saying before, it's some arbitrary four tensor, which is a function of temperature. Its only requirement is that it's symmetric in mu nu and rho sigma, and, and symmetric under the exchange of mu nu with rho sigma. If you want, me, if you want I can put a second bracket here. Uh, let, let me write it a bit better. Claim all hydrodynamic dissipative strength pieces can be assembled in this form. This was something that came out of a very impressive analysis of Shantani Bhattacharya that we managed to exploit to show that this is true. OK? So I, I'm not going to show you how to write this in terms of this, but it, it can be done. I, I'll, I'll refer you to the literature. But then there's this plethora of things, and in, in fact, Atish, 
alluded to something, because this piece is in equilibrium. This does not belong to T mu nu d. It actually belongs here. Equilibrium, and this comes from Z equilibrium. The stress tensor in HS comes by taking this guy and varying it with respect to the matrix. You get the stress tensor by putting a system on curved space and varying with respect to the matrix, and that's what you get from here. And clearly, if you vary the, the free energy piece with respect to the matrix, which is basically the piece in this root gamma, then you would get both the epsilon piece and the p piece. I'll leave that as an exercise to show that that's true. And the, the relation between p and the free energy is basically p equals free, minus the free energy, and epsilon is basically uh, p minus t, t p prime or something like that, which is the usual ledge under transform statement. Now, this is whole other five classes, uh, six classes, that uh, don't seem to know anything about dissipation. So first of all, claim that all of dissipation is contained in this four tensor. Everything else satisfies this homogeneous equation with the right-hand side set to zero, which means there are many solutions to the homogeneous equation. Question is, how do you classify them? One, cl one class I already gave you, but there are many others which are not obtained from that homogeneous, which are, which are other solutions to the homogeneous equation. So this guy, uh, so here for example, this is another easy thing to write. You can take the same st structure, but now make it anti-symmetric in mu nu and rho sigma exchange. Now you take this and plug this in here. You have two L beta G mu nu L, uh, copies of L beta G, but the indices are anti-symmetric. So this term vanishes, and therefore it's a consistent solution with delta equals zero. So the, you, you also simultaneously solve for G sigma. I'm not writing out what G sigma looks like or the entropy current looks like in all these cases. Okay, I'm just writing out what the energy momentum tensor is because that's a physical object. There can be arbitrary order in derivatives. So Landau Lifshitz has this piece to zeroth order. Landau Lifshitz has this piece to one derivative, which is explicit here. Okay, so basically this eta is some constant tensor that gives you that eta. Landau Lifshitz doesn't have this because this does not show up at first order in derivatives in any system except parity violating systems in two plus one dimensions. Okay, and Landau Lifshitz didn't consider parity violating systems. Telling coming. So I haven't told you what they are. So, so here there is no there is no energy momentum transport. We actually have a conserved entropy current. This is relevant in circumstances where you have topological degeneracy in the ground state, because you have non-zero ground state entropy, but no energy momentum transport. This guy is the first case where Landau Lifshitz could have figured out had they gone one higher order, but they didn't. And so here there is um, there's basically terms like vorticity squared. The vorticity is basically the anti-symmetrized derivative of the velocity, roughly. Uh, sorry, I, 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 I misspeak. This is not here. This is here. Um, these, there's a part of sigma squared which is here. Let me say it that way. I'll write down what this is in a second. The other three. Um, someone asked Nati the other day a very interesting question. What about anomalies, Toft anomalies in um, thermal physics? Okay. 
Again, Landau Lifshitz didn't know about Toft anomalies because it was before Toft. Um, and um, and uh, there's a very interesting statement that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that one can make. So to do that, I have to actually turn back the charges because anomalies don't show up unless I have charges. So for neutral fluid, what I said is complete. But let's say you have a charged fluid. And let's say this fluid is charged under some background uh, global symmetry, which has a Toft anomaly. Now what you would say is the following statement, that if you don't turn on, and this is a statement Nati made, that if you don't turn on background fields, then the current is conserved. If you turn on background fields, then there's a term here, which, is, which I will call some kind of Hall current, which is a functional of the background F mu nu. Okay. That's how anomalies work in four dimensions. The co conservation of J would be violated by an E dot B term on the right-hand side. But E dot B is a background electric and magnetic field. It's not a gauge, gauge current. Okay, so this is coming from the triangle diagram as Nati was drawing with three vertices all coupling to external currents. Okay. Um, now, when you turn on temperature, and you can ask the following question. You can take the following order of limits. You can turn on background fields, turn on temperature, solve, solve, keep this equation intact. You can ask how, how much the current is not conserved by the background. And then, having worked out what J is, turn off the background fields. The statement is that J has pieces that know about the anomaly even if you don't turn on background fields. Okay. So in other words, J would be the charge density times velocity minus conductivity times, oh God. Um, let me call the sigma C. Sigma comes up in 100, 100 different places. Um, and. Uh, there's a vector here. Basically, the term gradient of the chemical potential gives you conductivity. I, I put a quotes here because this is not quite the full gradient. It's just a spatial part of the gradient. Um, and, but then there's another piece which comes from this contribution. There's a piece here which comes proportional to the vorticity contracted with velocity. And this piece basically tells you that there is a current flowing in a direction normal to the ve velocity. This is roughly speaking in the direction of velocity. This current is in the direction of velocity. But here there's a transverse current. And the coefficient here is set by the Toft anomaly. It's precisely fixed, and you can get it directly from some basic data of the theory without doing any, any of this magic. That guy is here. Okay. This is a big surprise. Um, I think various people have thought about this in the past, but the first smoking gun signal that such things exist came out of an ADS-CFT analysis that was done by Logan Iagam and various students at TIFR about 10 years ago. It caused various people to question Landau leaf sheets, and when you sort of did all the analysis again, taking into account things that they had missed, parity violating terms and so on, it works precisely in this general formalism. Okay. Now, there's one more wrinkle, which is that in certain number of dimensions, you can have Lorentz anomalies. Okay? If you have a flavor current that's anomalous, it can also give you a frame anomaly for the Lorentz rotations. Those guys also contribute, and they're sometimes called mixed gauge gravitational anomalies, and they show up here.
Okay? And once you have this, you also have terms here which come from, can again write down a stress tensor piece. It involves some five tensor. Um, and some other contractions of, of G with L beta. Okay, I'm not writing a full tensor structure, but there's some other tensor structure you can work out which belongs in this class. Okay, so what, what I want to emphasize is that much of this could have been done many years ago, but it was helpful to have a lot of intuition that came primarily from holographic analysis and classes of stress tensors that were derived there to sort of complete this statement. So what we have now is a statement about what hydrodynamics ought to be as a low energy theory. We have to have a theory which gives you all these eight classes. These eight classes are no more than these eight classes. So you have a benchmark for the low energy theory. So you can ask, take your favorite microscopic theory. It's in thermal state. It's not quite in equilibrium. Start with a microscopic theory, integrate things out, and motivate an effective action that captures these pieces of data. Okay. So you can try this following naive thing, which is inspired by the equilibrium partition function, and you can see what you, how far you get. And that quickly makes you realize that the story is a lot more richer, and you have to do a lot more, which then will, in the last 10 minutes, tie me back to where I, where I began in the last couple of lectures. Okay. So you could say, construct an effective action as a for hydro, whose job is to give you those eight classes. And those, that was an off-shell classification, so you should have an action because that action by definition is off-shell. And the first objection every one of you would give me is that dissipation is tricky because it seems like you're losing information, so how can you write down an action for dissipation? So let's come back to that. Let's postpone that question to a sec for a second. Let's just ask, can we write down an action that at least gives us the remaining seven classes that don't know about dissipation? Because they don't, they're conservative. They, the energy momentum is conserved. They're not producing any entropy. So how can you not write an action? Okay. So here we have an action. We have something that it looks like an action. It's not quite an action. It's a partition function. It's on the spatial manifold. But you see, because it's on the spatial manifold and the time direction is just, just a killing direction, nothing prevents you from upgrading this to a full integral over space time. because that just basically homogeneously removing a factor of beta. So why don't I write an action which says some, some action, which is, a, which is given in terms of the Lagrangian density, which is the functional of g mu nu and beta mu. Scalar function built out of two pieces of data, anti-done. Right? I've just allowed myself to forget the fact that these things were supposed to be killing fields. Just write down this action of this kind. Two problems. One, and the most obvious one, if you write down an action with a variable which is a vector field, you'll get some vectorial equations of motion all right, but no guarantees that you get those equations of motion are conservation equations. Because energy momentum conservation implies Euler-Lagrange equations 
but the opposite arrow is not always true. It just takes simple examples and you'll see, because this follows from background diffeomorphism invariance. Okay? This follows by varying the physical, date, physical fields. They're not the same thing. Okay, so clearly what, what has to be true is that not all of beta can be dynamical data. So there's a way around this, and there's a way around this that uh, almost everybody who's done, who's read the first chapter of Polchinski knows. Yes? The number go to action has gravity on the world sheet and the, the equation of motion of the world sheet gravity, gravity tell you that the energy momentum is conserved and, and basically you can use that trick to go, go about this. So you basically don't keep all of beta mu independent but only a part of beta mu which is like the target space coordinates pulled back onto some kind of world sheet. So here what you do is basically think of some world volume I'll use the word D-brain, but it's not really a D-brain. It's a world volume, but it's a space-filling world volume. And here is my physical space-time. And here live beta mu and g mu nu. And the world volume has some intrinsic coordinate sigma. Oh god, sigma again. OK, sigma a. Um, and I have some map which maps me from the world volume to space time through some, which gives me space time coordinates as a function of world volume coordinates. And on this world volume, I have the pullback of beta to be beta A and the pullback of G mu nu to be G A B. The dynamical variables are X mu, and you can convince yourself very quickly that if you do this embedding, Equations of motion of x mu are precisely energy momentum conservations pushed forward into space time. So there's a sigma model interpretation of hydrodynamics where you can think of x mu's as the dynamical variables. And you can write down the theory living on some auxiliary space. In fact, you can think of my this beta as some kind of flag on this reference on this world volume. So you really have a D-brain-like theory. The novelty from the D-brain is that this D-brain carries a flag. It carries a local knowledge of what the local temperature and velocities are. So you can think of this space-time as having the vibration structure, and this is pushed forward to space-time. Okay. Now that sounds great. That solves this problem. That fixes here t mu t mu nu equals zero follows from is implied by variation of Lagrangian with respect to x equals zero, but uh, it doesn't solve this problem. What does it solve? It gets right this structure because it's almost guaranteed to get this structure right from the point of view of the equilibrium analysis, and it gets this structure right. So it gets you the energy momentum tensor which belongs to these two classes. It just doesn't do the job for the rest of them. Yeah? So the question remains, what do you do to get the data for the remaining sectors? And there are two hints that something must give. Two hints that something must give are the fact that the microscopic theory was on a shinger keldish contour. And what we wanted to do was start here, integrate things out, and write down some kind of classical effective field theory. For 
these x mu variables. So where did these x mu variables come from is the first question we should ask ourselves because the microscopic theory had some maybe quarks and gluons. It didn't have x mu's. The x mu's are some emergent variables. They're like pions in QCD. And the answer is provided by the contour because on this contour, just as I have two sets of fields, I also had two sets of sources. I had right and left sources, which I was calling J right and J left. But that means that I have G mu nu right and G mu nu left in the microscopic theory. Not only that, because of the structure of schwinger kellisch theory, there are interactions between the left and the right contour. As I start in the microscopic theory, I have all this structure. If I start integrating out some degrees of freedom on the right and left, I will start non-trivially coupling the two, two bits. Right? By, by definition, because if you just write propagators, the propagators talk, talk across the contours. So I should keep track of everything. And the first question you should have asked yourself is, why do you have only one classical degree of freedom where is the other guy? Because there was a right and a left, so there should have been something like a right plus left or a right minus left, but only one of them is visible in the low energy theory. And the answer to this, again, comes from something that one tends to ignore in hydrodynamics. One tends to do the average description of how the fluid flows. But as with any statistical description, there are fluctuations on top of this average. Right? Because if you're doing statistical mechanics, what you usually ask in a canonical ensemble is what is the average value of energy? That gives you the answer that comes from the microcanonical ensemble. But then you ask yourself, oh, what is the fluctuations around the canonical value of an average value of energy? Those are buried in the difference fields. So the average field is really the right plus left in some heuristic sense, schwinger keldish average. The fluctuations are constrained by the right, left, mi right minus left. And so you should write down a theory which has both of these things. And moreover, you can think of these guys as the Goldstone modes for breaking diffio right times diffio left down to the common diffio because you can independently do diffio morphisms up and down but in the low energy theory, you're only sensitive to the averages. Everything that's not in the averages is buried in the fluctuations. So long story short, to write down the hydrodynamic effective field theory, you cannot just stop here. You have to take insight from this contour and then write down a theory which has all these pieces of data. The trouble is, if one just goes about it naively, one is not going to match the fluctuations correctly. Because we saw there were microscopic constraints on precisely this sector. This was the piece that was constrained by the topological invariance. Okay? And so to go from the macroscopic theory, you want to write down so the macroscopic theory should be constrained by our SK KMS algebra and one can do this. Can I have two minutes? Okay. 
And what I'm going to just write down is the answer to this problem without telling you where it co comes from and refer you to the literature of saying that, where was this action? Write it here. Or basically saying that you can write down a gauge sigma model with this x field upgraded to the super field x we were talking about yesterday. And the symmetry we are gauging is thermal diffeomorphisms So, and one advantage of doing it this way is that not only do you get pretty much everything in this classification, but you can also write down the dissipative action. Because in some rough sense, in the same sense as Hiroshi was talking about in the previous lecture, there's a sense in which the two copies, roughly speaking, take care of how one, one of them can be a heat bath for the other. That's a very heuristic statement. I can explain that a bit better, but you can write down a Lagrangian theory which captures this structure. So I, I'll, I'll put up some notes and refer you to the literature on where this all is constructed. But I hope I've given you a flavor for where, what the constraints are in the microscopic theory and what is the, at least what's the target goal for the macroscopic theory that you want to achieve. And the link between, I've sort of elided over but hopefully you have enough information at your disposal to sort of go ahead and learn that for yourself. Okay, let me stop here.